Hey, how are you? Uh, thanks, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm going to try and do a little uh, technology magic here with the aid of my lovely assistant. And uh, we'll start. Let's see. Choose presentation. Where's that? Okay, let's see. There you go. Okay. Choose presentation. Go ahead. Where? Right there. Double click on share. All right. And new share. Where is it? At? Up there in the green. New share. And then PowerPoint presentation. See that? Ask them if they can see the bricks. Can you guys see the bricks? Sure. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, I can see them. Yes. Here. And you want this one here. I'm going to start a slideshow. One first, second time. Okay. There we go. Now we go up here. How's that look? Great. That's it. No, no, no. That's it. I don't think that's it. Okay. All right. We're still figuring this out. Uh, I it's... This will do. Okay. All right. Oh. Sorry. We're going back. <laughs> we're going back. All right. So welcome. Uh, my name is Scott Craven. As Martha was so nice to give me that wonderful introduction. Uh, and I do talk about a lot of aspects of the Hudson River Valley here. I love the Hudson River Valley. Um, and we're talking about bricks today, for which I got a fair amount of grief from my friends about. Uh, we were talking beforehand, and there's a lot of people are wondering if uh, we're going to do eight foot two by fours next or something as equally as exciting as, as these bricks. But I promise you, I, I've learned a lot about bricks myself in the last couple of weeks and uh, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, why do, am I doing this? Well, first of all, I'm town historian. It's part of the gig. And I'm a huge fan of uh, your group. I think you guys do a wonderful job. People come to me all the time, uh, new folks into the community at the at the information desk. Well, what should I do to, to learn Austin? I say, go take the go take the Sunday afternoon walk with Alan Stahl at Sparta. It is not to be missed. It is, uh, it's one of my favorites and I'm, I'm overdue to go again myself. Uh, currently I'm working on Croton Point. We're doing a, myself and uh, Caroline Curvin are work doing a book project and it's got a lot of uh, bricks in it. We'll talk about that today. Uh, and this talks about uh, two of my favorite things of local history. Uh, one is everyday history, things we see every single day and and I'm as guilty of it any as anybody, and just don't. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and just don't. Marinette calling. Oh <laughs> and so we're talking about uh, things we see every day, and I love that kind of history. I do a couple talks. One about Route Nine, and, and Mary, my wife, calls it stuff Scott sees on his drive to work, but she doesn't say stuff. And the other I I do on ships in the Hudson River, and. Uh, I call it, uh, my wife calls it stuff Scott sees from his deck. So I love looking at everyday things. I think there's, we live in such a, a fascinating community and area. And I know that a lot of us, including me, every day drive by history without appreciating it or, or realizing what it is. And I love the thought of bricks and something called uh, the hinterland. You know, every great city needs a great country, country area backing it up. New York City and the Hudson River Valley could not exist without each other. You know, it's funny that, you know, people in the city, you know, traditionally look at folks who live upstate as kind of like, you know, hillbillies or such. Um, but the reality, and we kind of look at people in the city as, you know, not being, not, you know, city slickers. The reality of it is we desperately need each other. Uh, we're only whole when we're working together. And it's the relationship between this valley and this wonderful city that um, makes it such a special place. So I love uh, this, this topic. However, I have to warn you, um, I, I give talks on, on fishing or fish in the Hudson River Valley sometimes. 
and people come and ask me about the best lures to use for stripers and, you know, what time it takes. Listen, <laughs> I'm the world's worst fisherman. So along those same lines, I'm going to talk about bricks tonight. But believe me, this is not a DIY special on how to make a brick wall because I am the last person in the world who could help you with that. So we'll talk about bricks, but what we won't talk about is how, how to use bricks. And I got to tell you, um, back before, when I, before I was a cop and I was uh, weak of mind and strong of back, I worked as a uh, construction laborer, like a lot of young men do. And in my last three months, I was a masonry helper. So for three months, I was assigned to a mason who was laying uh, brick and concrete block. And my job was to mix concrete and supply him with bricks. And I got to tell you, he wasn't happy once. He gave me the business from day one. It was brutal work. And then he would sit there at lunch and eat sardine sandwiches and drink homemade wine and stare at me and mumble things. So I got to tell you, just the thought of thinking about building brick walls all over again gave me nightmares. It was not a, a, not a great time in my life. But boy, this kid, this guy was tough. So bricks, <laughs> that gentleman there, you see, is holding that, uh, that V-shaped thing on top of his, uh, that little stick there. That's called a hot, that's called a hod, H-O-D, hod. And what that guy did, what men and well, men like him did is they were hod carriers and they were responsible for supplying two masons with brick or block and mortar during the day. And so they would load those hods up with bricks or concrete block or mortar and walk up and down stairs all day. I think they were the world's toughest people. Those of you who are running in the 60s and 70s like I was, uh, you might know this guy. This is the world's most famous hod carrier. At least he was back then. His name was Walter Stack. So Walter Stack was the first person ever in a Nike commercial. He was the one who invented the expression, starch, starch slow and taper off. He, uh, he used to drink a six pack of beer while he was running marathons and drink it during the course of the marathon and just throw them away. He was, uh, he was quite the character. And every day he would swim in San Francisco Bay, run over the Golden Gate Bridge, and then carry bricks as a hod carrier up and down all day long, in, well into his 70s. So when Nike did their first Just Do It commercial, they use Walter Stack, the uh, world's toughest hod carrier, as their symbol. So I had an early appreciation for just how tough these brick guys were. For those of you who follow the NFL back in the day, uh, that's Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice was famous for catching uh, passes from Joe Montana and then ultimately for the Oakland Raiders. The greatest NFL receiver ever has established records that will never, ever be broken. Uh, and he attributes, he originally attributed a lot of his success to the fact that when he was growing up, his father was a bricklayer. And his job and his brother's job in Alabama all day long in Mississippi was to, was to supply their father with bricks. And the two sons would toss bricks back and forth to each other. And if he had a brother like I do, you know, there was a little sauce on them. So he got his start catching bricks and ultimately became the greatest football catcher in history. You know, I gave this talk, a, a variation of this talk last Saturday or two Saturdays ago. It was, it was uh, Easter Eve, uh, Passover and Ramadan. I didn't think anybody was going to show up, uh, but they did. And I thought it was... Uh, kind of fitting that we were talking about bricks on such a night. Uh, in the good old days, uh, Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner, Charlton Heston told Yul Brenner, you know, let my people go. And Yul Brenner and uh, Edward G. Robinson weren't 
weren't satisfied saying, no, we're not going to let you, not only are we not going to let your people go, we are no longer going to allow you to use straw or we're not going to provide you with straw for your bricks. And that was it. That tore it. So next thing we know, um, there's blood and frogs and firstborn and pharaohs at the bottom of the Red Sea. So I think, you know, this is a, an age old story of, you, you know, you don't mess with a man's brick making. And I think this is the, the classic uh, story about it. And I just thought it was appropriate that we started on that particular night. So be careful. So to sum it up, guys who work with bricks are tough. Don't mess with a person's brick making. Now these are Adobe bricks. These are not what we're gonna be talking about tonight. These are what the Israelites were making. This is just for all practical purposes, dried mud. And there are Adobe bricks in the Southwest and the Middle East that have lasted for thousands of years. They are sand, clay, and usually some organic material like straw that holds them together so they can dry in the sun. And built appropriately, they can last for a very long time. They would not last for a very long time up here. So we have a different kind of brick up here. We have uh, clay, we have sand and clay red bricks that are fired. So they're, they're formed, uh, dried, and then they are put in a kiln for a period of time. And ultimately they come out and they're significantly uh, harder than an adobe brick. And they also can last forever. And that's the mortar between them. Uh, how, what bricks are called? Well, they're stretchers and shorts and soldiers and sailors. They all have names depending on their position in the wall. And that position, you, that pattern you see in the wall is called a bond. And that bond is for a reason, it's not just for decoration. So what happens is, and we'll talk about this later, brick walls that are structural are usually eight, 12 or 16 inches thick because four inches is the width of a brick and that's, the, that's how they break it down. So it's multiple layers of brick walls. And to tie the brick walls together, they need, they need something called a bonding course. So when you see a brick up here in the top, it's short. What that is, is it's, face, it's connecting the two brick walls together. So it's perpendicular to us instead of parallel. So when you see these shorts in the, and these longs in the wall, the shorts are actually bonding the walls together. It's called a bonding course. So when you see that bond, it's not just um, decoration. It's, it's a real structural thing. Today, if you see a modern brick wall with all long bricks like this, um, they're probably held, the, and it's structural, they're probably held together by, uh, by uh, metal straps, but they have to be something. But back in the day, this is what they did. They had these patterns to bind them all together and that was called a bond. So why are bricks red? Bricks are red for the same reason this barn is red. Because back in the old days, colonial America, the most common pigment around for just about everything was iron oxide. So when you look at a red brick, it's red because it has iron in it, iron oxide, very, very common around here. When you see barns painted red, they were originally painted red because that was the only pigment they had was that iron oxide and they used that and that's why barns are traditionally red. So barns and bricks are red for the same reason. And of course there are yellow bricks, not many, but they're famous. Uh, some come from the Netherlands themselves if you look in the old Dutch church down on Route 9, you'll see yellow bricks uh, built into the old Dutch church. Those actually came from the Netherlands. These bricks up here, and I don't know where they came from. This is Peekskill. That is the yellow brick road, the famous yellow brick road, according to Peekskill, down by the train tracks. Frank Lyman Baum in 1868 went to the Peekskill Military Academy for one year. And he got off the train right there and walked up this yellow brick road to go to school. Because of that, Peekskill says that is the um, inspiration for the yellow brick road in the Wizard of Oz. 
Now, Peekskill, uh, I love those guys. There's some great historians up there. And I'm both uh, frustrated and envious of their ability to grab history and shamelessly promote it. I wish we were as good at that. I mean, Lincoln was here on that train about as long as he was in Peekskill. Uh, yet they have an ephedra, a museum, a, a parade, and so a society, the whole drill. You wouldn't even know he was here. Um, they are really good at grabbing history and promoting it, and it's it's to their credit. Uh, this one here, this talk that the Yellow Brick Road is actually probably not, but they do have a skipping contest in it in the summer, and they do qu talk quite a bit about it. And it's probably the most famous uh, yellow brick in the Hudson River Valley. This is a clinker. This is a brick you will find along the water uh, commonly. I found quite a few recently. We were just talking about uh, the fact that they have to fire bricks and they have to put them in a kiln. Well, if they fire them too much, they become these, which are called clinkers. And they become like vitrified, like too hard and brittle. So what they do is they throw them away. And typically they threw them away in the water around the brickyards to act as an erosion control. So today, if you walk the point, have a straw bay or, or Croton Point or Croton Landing, you'll see all these bricks and a lot of them are what they call clinkers. And I remember Mr. O saying years ago, when they were building the uh, Croton Aqueduct, John Bloomfield Jervis would ring the bricks to see if they were good quality. And I have read also that clinkers are called clinkers because when you knock them together, they make a distinct sound because they're not sound. So if you see a clinker, knock it with another brick, it might make a strange sound. Uh, that was the uh, quality control of the day. But those are clinkers, you see lots of them. Sometimes they look like this, where they clunk to the point where they're just molten glass. <laughs> and you'll, you'll see a lot of them. Uh, they're pretty cool. We're going to talk about them uh, in one, when we talk about one Rockledge, uh, there has been, they have written things about them using burned end bricks as a form of um, architectural detail. I'm not so sure about that. We'll talk about that later, but that's a, that's a real clinker. And there's another bond. That is a Belgium bond. So it was a stretcher, a short, alternating up and down. And one of the things about bricks, and one of the things that one of the reasons people love them so much is they have imprints in them. So there have been over 300 brick brands identified in the Hudson River Valley. This is one of them. And this is uh, my neighbor's patio next door. You see them all the time. And I'll, I'll show you a website at the end of this where you can go on and look them all up. They've got uh, great histories for each and every one of them. And uh, it's one of the reasons people are so enamored by them. There's Peck. And this is also what you see here. Uh, you see Peck is in there. That's from Haverstraw. Uh, it's also got an indentation in the brick. That's called a frog. And that was put there in the about the 1880s on uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, made it easier to pick the brick up. It held mortar better, it used less, less material, and it allowed you to uh, put your name brand in there. And by the way, anybody know why a brick is that size? You know, most things in history, they're not coincidence. They're, they're usually a size, a standard for a reason, like the four foot, eight and a half inch standard gauge railroad, that's for a reason. Why is a brick roughly eight inches long, two and a quarter inches wide, four inches wide? Why? Well, it's because it's the biggest, it's the biggest thing you could pick up with one hand and hold a trowel of mortar with, with the other. So it just allows you, it's, 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 the, it's the result of the size of the human hand. That is why a brick uh, is typically that size. Here's another one, Denning Point Brickworks. This is out of um, 
uh, outside of Beacon. They've got a strange frog pointed on the ends. Gormley, this is uh, George's Island. Quite a few of them up there. Why are there so many bricks here? Well, my wife gets on me about this because apparently every lecture or talk or discussion I have with people about the Hudson River always starts with the ice. And it really should anyway. You know, we, we talk about the ice age as if something happened a really long time ago. It actually didn't. And it happened relatively recently, as of about 20,000 years ago, there was a massive amount of ice right here. Every single road we, every single hill we walk up, road we coast down, every valley, every shoreline is all a result of this ice. And this valley is, is a creation of it. And when we say 20,000 years ago, that's probably when it was gone from here 18,000 years ago, melting back up north. But the reality of it is there were people like you and me in North America then. There were people in the valley probably 10, 11, 12,000 years ago that we know of, maybe even earlier. It was not that long ago. And it, it shaped, it profoundly shaped the valley and our history. If anybody's ever been out west and seen a lake that flows out from underneath a glacier, you know that it looks like milk or kind of like aquamarine. It's crazy. It's, it's bizarre looking the first time I ever saw it. And what it is, is what it, the reason it looks like that is because when water gets ground, when ice grinds rock under a thousand feet of it, it turns into flour, even finer than sand. So when it runs into the water, it creates this cloud. And ultimately, this cloud creates silt and clay. So when the glacier was receding up the valley and scraping across our bedrock, the water that was rushing into the valley looked like this and created a huge amount of uh, silt and then ultimately clay beds. Here's a clay bed on uh, Croton Point. Uh, if you'll notice, it has stripes in it. That's called varved clay. So what happened is after the last, the last glacier receded, it left behind a pile of rubble uh, at the end of its reach down by New York City that went east-west that we today call Long Island. That was a terminal moraine. And behind it backed up what was left of the Hudson River. And the Hudson River we know today was a series of lakes all the way to Albany. And into those lakes poured those rivers filled with all that little rock flower. And when they, when they came in in the summer, they were one color. When they came in, in the winter, they were the other. So they left these striations in the clay. That's seasonal. Each time you see a, a dark and a light band, that's one year. And they're called varved clays. And you can see them out in Croton Point. You could also see things on Croton Point called clay babies. And it's one of the best places to, to, to look for them. Uh, what they are is it's clay and silt form around these little pieces of organic material. I, I always compare it to like a, like a pearl forming in an oyster and they create these bizarre weird shapes. Sometimes they look like little babies. If you ever want to, the Croton Point Nature Center has a box full of them. And Croton Point's a good place to see them. I've never, see, I've never found one myself, but Caroline found one recently. So they're out there. And it's a, it's a great place to find clay babies. So the clay is deposited in this lake, which backs up behind this massive line of boulders we call Long Island, Terminal Marine. And it, gets, it fills up with water and it gets deeper than the Hudson River is today. And ultimately, as the glaciers recede farther and farther back up the valley, eventually they're gonna let loose the glacial lake that fills where the Great Lakes are today. And that massive lake, significantly bigger than the Great Lakes, is gonna rush into the Hudson River Valley and start to fill these lakes up higher and higher and higher. To the point where 
they'll start spilling over the top of this giant terminal moraine right at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And once they spill, start spilling over the top of it, they melt it like butter and they run right through it. And for almost 90 days, everything flies down the Hudson River Valley through this gap where the Verrazano Bridge is out across the continental shelf, which is exposed at the time and dumps into the ocean and drains the valley of all the water. Now, slowly as the glaciers melt and sea, sea level rises, the water will come back up the valley and fill it up again, but never as high as the lake. So all those silt and clay beds that were formed during the, the six, seven, eight, nine thousand years that it was a series of lakes are exposed and are above the water line. They're everywhere. So they're perfect. They're asking to be used as bricks. This is an old picture of Croton Point. That is the old railroad yard. I think this is 1909. If you look in the background, you'll see the top of that plateau. That is the level of the old lake when it was a delta. Today, when you go out on Croton Point, you drive over the railroad tracks and you, you approach the point and you see that high point to your right, that is the old delta above you. Because when the lake filled up, it was deeper than the, the height of the Hudson River today. And that's only important because all that clay that had been deposited for those thousands of years, you didn't have to dig it up, it was right there. Why are bricks important? Well, every city has a reckoning. And uh, New York City's reckoning was uh, 1835, Dece uh, December 16th, 1835. 674 buildings burned in 16 hours. They were, they were in serious trouble. They were also suffering through a series of uh, cholera epidemics and they had no potable drinking water. Now, I love Old Saybrook, Connecticut. My mom lives in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. I love the mouth of the, old, of the Connecticut River there. And if it hadn't been, if, if they hadn't it had been able to tackle these issues of water to Manhattan and cheap, durable building materials, New York City would be Old Saybrook, Connecticut today. Not that that's a bad thing, but we need New York City. They had a reckoning. So what they did was they reached up into our valley, their valley, our valley, and they looked for the two things, water and a cheap, durable, fire-resistant building material so their, their city would no longer burn to the ground. And they found them right here. How do you make a Hudson Valley brick? Well, it's called winning the clay. The easy part is it's not underwater. It's all in these giant banks that were left inside of this old lake when it, all the flood left it high and dry. So first you dig the clay out. Then originally you have to form it. You have to take one of these, these are typically they're six, six long. They're made of cherry. You have to dust them with a little bit of sand, pack the clay in there, flip them over and you have a molded brick. Now remember, <laughs> between 1790 and 1910, they use between 28 and 56 billion bricks to build New York City six bricks at a time at first. And then you had to dry them, not fire them, dry them. Now, if you dried these all, originally they would be adobe bricks at, to some point and you would be good. And as long as you lived in some place like Iraq or New Mexico, you could build yourself a little house and live there happily in Iraq, but not here. Here they had to be fired. And it was brutal backbreaking stoop labor to turn the bricks around, make sure they all get as dried as much as possible before you put them in the kiln. A lot of these workers, they were immigrants. They were uh, African-Americans up from the South. Um, they, they worked for horrible wages and it was uh, brutal work and it was extremely seasonal. You can only do it in the summer. 
These are drying sheds over in Havistraw. The entire waterline of Havistraw was these, as far as the eye could see, drying these bricks out. Here's another where they dried them vertically. This is upstate. They took up a tremendous amount of uh, real estate. You can see them in the back there to the left, digging out the clay right there, molding it, drying it, and preparing it for the kiln. Here's a kiln. Most of them, they weren't this sophisticated. Most of this was more common. And they fired them for two weeks. And a lot of them didn't come out correctly. They became clinkers. They used a tremendous amount of fuel, mostly cordwood. And they fired these bricks before they brought them down to the city. And the fact that these clay beds were next to this this fantastic river and was, they were able to be transported was one of the reasons they were so economically viable. That's a schooner, not a sloop. That is the F-150 pickup truck of its day. That could hold 80,000 bricks. 80,000 bricks is about the amount of bricks you need for uh, a single family home, two stories tall. Now you could also use, and they ultimately did use barges, they could hold 300,000 bricks. And they use them in long, long trains. But it was this economical ability to move these heavy, cheap blocks that made it so critical in the Hudson Valley to New York City. A couple of things happened in the 1800s that really, really changed uh, brick making. The first thing that happened was this. That's, that's a lump of anthracite coal. So coal comes in a bunch of different forms. Uh, originally, you know, it's a swamp, then it's peat, then it's lignite, then it's bituminite, then it becomes really hard stone coal called anthracite. It burns clean. It provides more heat than any other piece of coal. And it's all over in Eastern Pennsylvania. And when they discovered that it could be used as a fuel, because it's difficult to ignite, the first thing the Hudson Valley did was they dropped three canals over there and start sucking anthracite into New York City, which drives the economy here in the Valley. But what somebody realized, his name was James Woods, was that if you took this, all this coal dust, which nobody was using, and you mixed it in with the clay and the sand of the brick you're about to fire, you reduce the firing time by a half. That's like going to Ford and saying, it doesn't take a week to build an F-150, it takes two days. It revolutionized brick making. It doubled their output almost overnight because of the ability to get this anthracite coal, mix it up into the sand and the clay and decrease the firing time. The only reason I, the only thing I can think of why I would do that in the bad old days when I was in college, before we had microwaves, we used to put a big 10 penny nail in a baked potato before you put it in the oven. For some reason that made it cook faster because it brought the heat into the middle of the potato. I assume it's the same thing. But whatever the reason was, it was tremendously successful. Today, if you walk over and have a straw on the beach, you'll see as much what they call sea coal as you will uh, old bricks. Coal is, it's not, it doesn't float, but it darn near does. It's lighter than almost any of the rocks. So you see it get washed up on the beach much more commonly. And since it was such an enormous, it was so critical and an enormous part of the fuel and part of the brick industry, a lot of it got dumped in the Hudson. So if you walk along the Hudson today or we're have a straw, this is what you'll see. Old pieces of brick, some sea glass, and lots of coal. And the, we talked about the frog. This also was innovation in the 1800s, reducing the amount of material it needed, making it easier to pick up, letting you put your brand in it. If you see a brick without a frog, it's probably pretty old, probably pretty old. And last but not least was the molding machine. You know, we talked about those, those uh, hand molding bricks in the beginning of the 1800s where they'd have to put them in and flip them over. Eventually they got a machine that just squirted them out. 
So now they're mechanically molding bricks. They're putting uh, coal dust in there and increase the firing time. And they're adding a frog to the brick itself. So in 100 years, brick making changes a lot in the valley. Today, half a straw is the center of brick making in the valley. Uh, over 40 brick yards at one point. I didn't know this, but uh, originally in the early 1800s, the town of Havistral was called the town of Warren, after General Warren for Bunker Hill. Ultimately, they changed it back to the Lenape name or Dutch name, Havistru, Havistral, and that's what it's called today. That's where the Brick Museum is. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge part of the economy. And, and, they don't, and they know it. So if you go over to Havistral, you see things like this uh, all the time. And this is what a beach in Havistral looks like. You walk along the beach, it's just thousands and thousands of bricks and coal, often uh, clinkers. You can see the bricks here in the foreground are red and gray. That's because they were overfired. And when they used to take those old bricks, just throw them in the, in the water to help prevent erosion. Here's an old picture, 1890s, of the Haverstraw waterfront. See down there the Excelsior Brick Company in the lower right? That was an Excelsior Brick we were just looking at. And then Peck Bricks and things like that. It, it covered the waterfront and it was right next to downtown, which turned out to not be a good thing. Today, if you're driving up Route 9 by Croton, and you look across Havistraw Bay, and I know it's three and a half miles across there, but you'll see these two giant smokestacks. That's Bowline Power Plant. It was built in the early 1970s. And because we're so far away, when we come up the east bank of the Hudson, we don't really, it looks to us, look to me anyway, like we're just pretty much a straight shoreline. Um, it's not. It's very uh, convoluted. So there are the smokestacks to the right, and then to the left is this massive uh, lagoon, which I've kayaked in. You can kayak in there, it's beautiful. But if you notice, there's downtown Havistro in the upper left to the southwest, and it runs right up to that pit because that pit used to be uh, downtown Havistro until one horrible night in 1906, when a good chunk of Havistraw uh, slid into a massive clay pit and burst into flames. Uh, they think it killed 20 people. They're not sure to this day. Sorry about that. They're not sure to this day, but it was a massive, horrific uh, catastrophe, all because they just took too much clay. They were starting to notice cracks in the streets. They warned people about it but no one cared because it was all about making money. And one horrible night uh, in January down it went. And like things did back in 1906, when they collapsed, they caught on fire. And uh, it was a horrible fire as well. The only good news was uh, since it's seasonal, a lot of the workers in the brick factories weren't there. They were down in places like Rockland Lake cutting ice. So although 20 people were killed, uh, it, it could have been a lot worse. But the next time you go across, you go up Route 9 and you're, and you're going by Croton and you look across the bay there to your left, you see those twin towers, those twin smokestacks. Understand, that's marking a giant lagoon where downtown Havistraw used to be until it fell into a clay pit. There's another picture of it. Those are all tenements in the background that they use to uh, keep the clay, uh, clay workers. And that's what it looks like today. In the background, if you look carefully, you can see the Ostning Ferry down there uh, docked up next to the uh, condominiums. If you get, if you come across from Ostning on that ferry uh, four times in the morning, four times at night, that's where it'll dock. And that's where they have the Haverstraw Brick Museum. It's open on Saturdays and Sundays. It's really pretty cool. I mean, it doesn't take you long to go through it but they, they did an excellent job. It's brand new, it's modern. It's really neat because recently they, they've teamed up with uh, Pratt University 
And what they, what they found is you could 3D print bricks with clay as the medium. And what they're doing is they're, they're making bricks now that can hold um, like uh, plants and uh, bats and uh, bird's nests. So they're making these brick walls that are actually living walls that they manufacture. It's really neat. Uh, it's pretty cool they teamed up with these guys to do it as well. And when you go inside, you can see all the all the different um, brick brands. Today, there are a lot of old brick yards. Burr Plank was all brick yards. Today, if you go down, you can see the it says the Knickerbocker Ice Lake there. That's what we call Lake, Lake Mihaw today. See the ice house, that is actually um, a marina today. But all along the point there, Hudson River Brick Company, Hudson River Brick Company, that was a large company that would, would lease all those clay beds to smaller uh, brick companies. Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant was a brickyard. Uh, it was a big deal there. George's Island. All of that were brick, it was brickyards. That's today, that's looking south on uh, Havistraw Bay. There's Osgoyne Island. The only thing left is some of the brick structures. I love this. This is JJJ. This, uh, the Jova Brick Company. This guy immigrates to the Hudson River Valley in the 1870s to Newburgh with the hopes of planting sugar cane. Doesn't quite work out, but he creates this massive, it's Juan Yacinto Jova. And he creates this massive brickyard that survives well into the 20th century. So if you see these triple J bricks anywhere, and I saw this down at Verplank, they come from a guy and emigrate from Cuba that came up here to grow sugar cane. We call it Croton, uh, Croton Waterfront today. There's a, a bad picture of an anchor brick. Those are the ones from the Croton Watershed today. You could buy one on eBay for 50 bucks, or you could walk down there and probably pick one up in the Hudson River. There's a guy in Croton that actually incorporated historical bricks into a sidewalk. Can't tell you where, but that's cool. Built up, he built several uh, strips of them across the sidewalk. Croton Point, my favorite place. There's obviously in the foreground, Croton Point sticking out there. A lot of it was clay yards. That was, those were all clay pits there. To get an opportunity to take a walk with John Phillips or Mark Cheshire out there, they do them uh, twice a month now. We were walking along this flat spot and, and John was pointing out how you could see with the slight variations where the railroad tracks and narrow gauge railroad tracks ran to take the brick and the clay out of these fields and bring them up to the drying sheds. Really cool. This is a picture uh, around the turn of the last century. This would be the uh, swimming area of Croton Point. And if you look across that, you see the, the point out there that extends to the right, that point would be where the uh, nature center is today. So that big flat ground in front of there was all brick uh, kilns and brick drying sheds. For you uh, voters in the crowd, I happen to think, and I don't know if I'm right or not, that is what they call a naphtha launch. So it was powered by a, a type of kerosene that they no longer use. But that is uh, the, some of the brickyards, uh, how big they were at the time. And now that same place ultimately became a parking lot for the park. Today, it's just a long, big grassy field. But understand when you drive in and you see all those big wide open expanses, you're looking at old clay fields, old clay pits. And if you see a brick that says WAU, that's from Croton Point, William A. Underhill. Same with IXL. IXL is, the, is the, the molding machine that they invented there to mass produce them. So if you see either IXL or WAU bricks, they came from Croton Point. 
there's one of the Croton Point drying sheds. And there's one of the Croton Point brick structures. Now myself and people know more than I do disagree about this. I still think this is one of the old schoolhouses for the kids at the brickyards. It's 12 by 18. It wasn't the only schoolhouse, but it was the last one. And it's made of Croton Point brick as are their wine cellars, which are there today. And I always tell people that they are the oldest existing wine cellars in North America. I don't know if that's true, but I think it is. And they're all made of brick and they're buried right into the side there. And they're massive in there. It's a shame you can't go in there anymore. Uh, local brick structures. Okay. <laughs> So I wanted, when I, was, I started looking at you guys and, and thinking about bricks and, and Sparta and stuff, I was looking around and I stumbled onto these things called Sanborn Fire Maps. There's a guy named Daniel Alfred Sanborn. He's from, Mass, he's from Massachusetts. In the end of the 1800s, he starts producing uh, these maps for fire underwriters, insurance companies throughout North America. And what he does is he comes into a community and they meticulously detail everything that involves fire. So it'll be the population, the water system, the fire department, the prevailing winds. They talk about the wells, the building materials, what the roofs are made out of, the firefighting equipment, the types of structures. Here you can see the prevailing winds, Northwest and Southwest. It also lists every um, road in Austin and the ones that are paved the ones that are concrete and the ones that were and where the public electricity comes from. They're an incredible resource. So here's New York City on a Sanborn map. You'll notice that the pink buildings are, are brick, the yellow ones are wood. Now remember, in New York City, there were between 1790 and 1910, probably over 40 billion bricks were used. It took 380,000 bricks to make a standard post-Civil War seven-story building. It took about 200,000 bricks to make a pre-Civil War three or four-story building. So that's a lot of bricks. So check that out uh, on the Sanborn maps. I love this. So this is, a, this is I think this is 1924. And as part of their study of Ostning, they go to great length to discuss the water system here. They talk about Indian Brook Reservoir. They talk about how they pump it, they let it go from uh, by gravity from that uh, where Indian Brook is today by a 16 inch May to the Croton Bay pumping station, 3000 feet distance and 180 feet below the reservoir. So that's right by where 9A crosses the Croton River today. And then they pump it from there all the way up to where we, what we call Richard Wishney Park today. And they go through the whole thing. And I thought it was interesting that they pump it. They, in 1890, the first thing they do is they give away 180 feet of elevation and turn around and pump it right back up. Why did they do that? Well, there's the pumping station. It's still there today. You can see it when you drive over the 9A bridge, you can still see the, the smokestack coming up. I think they did that because in the 1890s, they probably ran those pumps by coal. And the best way to get coal was to bring it up by barge. And until 1915, the mouth of the Croton River had a drawbridge. So I suspect the reason that they ran it down to Croton River first before they ran it, they pumped it up to Pleasantville Road is because they could coal fire the pumps. If anybody knows that for a fact, I'd love to hear that. Here's an old picture of what the cops call Hubble's Corner. This is right there at Route 9. And there's, uh, there's a old bank bill. There's a Eastern Avenue. Uh, to your left is Main Street going down the Crescent. You could barely make out the Soldier's Monument there in front of the bank. That's now in front of, um, that's now on Pleasantville and Brookville. But this is what it looked like around the turn of the last century. And there's a horse well right there. This is what it looked like in 1903 on a Sanborn fire map. 
So you see, and it was actually two squares, Merchant Square and Pleasant Square. Uh, you see the Soldiers Monument right there in the middle of the intersection. You see where the municipal building is today was an antique furniture works. Now, I don't know what constituted antique in 1903. They might have been selling logs for all I know, but there was a one to two story wooden structure right there. And you'll notice next to it is a pink building. That's because it is made of um, brick. So is the one next to it. And then there are three wooden buildings, all three stories tall. I'm embarrassed to say one's a Chinese laundry, one's a saloon, and one's a bakery. And if you look in the back of the bakery, you can see there's another little pink thing there. That's the, that's the oven. That's where they baked all the stuff. And next was the St. Cloud Hotel. So by looking at this map, you could tell what structures were there, how tall they were. If you look at the Reeds Hotel there, you can see those numbers running down the side. First of all, it says, it says three up in the corner. That means it's three stories tall. And then on the side, it says 12, eight and eight along those structural walls. That is the thickness of the bricks in the individual um, uh, levels. And then in the upper right, you see that round open circle. That means it was a uh, metal roof. They talked about that as well. So they delineate everything. If you look at some of these structures in the back, these yellow ones, you see the ones with the crosses across them? Those are barns. There were lots of them. And you see Trinity Church to the left there, it's still there today. It's blue because it's stone. Now look in front of Reed's Hotel. It's got a blue line that runs across the front. So it's a, and it's got a yellow line that runs across the back. So it's got stone across the front and a wooden, probably a porch in the back. So there it is. That's the stone that's in the front of what then was Reed's Hotel. And <coughs> you look at the building on the left, that's stucco over brick. That was what the brick building was. So that's a three-story brick building with a facade of stone. And that stone is, for all practical purposes, uh, brownstone. Uh, brownstone was popular in the 1880s, 1890s, 1900. It was the vinyl siding of its day. It is not structural. It is a facade, a cladding that they use a lot in the city. It's sandstone. The reason they call it brownstone is it was originally red because of iron oxide. A lot of it, I don't know if this particular group, but a lot of it came from a small town in Connecticut called Portland. It's on the Connecticut River across from Middletown where Trinity College is. And uh, those old quarries were a water park not too long ago. But it was tremendously popular for a long time because it was soft, it was easily carved. They thought it looked better than brick. It weathered better um, with um, like industrial pollution stuff. But the problem is, and these uh, are folks here who do the conservancy of the uh, graveyards will tell you, the problem is you take sandstone, it's laid down like this. But when you put it up as cladding or as a tombstone, you put it up like this. And into all these little cracks can run water. And when water gets in there, it can freeze and expand and crack it off. So you can come up, come back one day and the front half of your, your house is gone. So it lost a lot of its popularity after a relatively short period of time. Brownstones are still famous, still synonymous with New York City. But understand this, every time you see a brownstone, you're looking at a brick building with a cladding of sandstone with iron oxide in it that came from somewhere probably in the Connecticut River Valley. So there it is again. Now it's the Austin Riding Academy. And this is 1911. It's dilapidated. You can see the, the, in the back is the uh, barn. There's an old dwelling where the parking lot is for the uh, municipal building now, and now it's Reed's Hotel and Saloon. And you can see, it says also there's a 35 feet, that's how tall it is up front. You can see the eight, eight and 12 along the structural walls. And you can see now in the back, their wooden, uh, their wooden porch is now two stories. And the oven is still there. 
And then in 1924, now it's the municipal building. It's also brick. It's 45 feet tall, offices first and second, public school above. That's where the, the village uh, is today. And you can see in the back, <clears throat> that small building that's pink with the blue around it. So that's a brick structure clad all the way around in masonry. I think that is the old um, building that's still there in the back. And there's our, our structure right there with the red 812. Those hash marks are openings in the side. So these, these uh, Sanborn fire maps are incredibly uh, rich in stuff. There it is today. There it was then. That's Brownstone, the city today. Ah, now let's get to Sparta. So there is probably your most, well, one of your most famous, you have three brick structures in Sparta. This is one rock ledge. Um, supposedly I was reading something and talked about the burnt headers and the fact that they could tell by the hue of the brick that it came from Albany. I don't know about that. Uh, what we do know is this building is not built all at one time. So there it is. Here's the old, there's the brick structure. You can see it on to the right there. Um, at the time, it's relatively small and square. It's got a little wing off it that's yellow, so it's wood. You see the other two brick structures down there, 12 Liberty and 2 Rock Ledge. Uh, 12 Liberty, which we're gonna talk about at the time, is called a reading room, only a small part of its brick. And then it's got those three additions that are wood. And then next to it, to Rock Ledge is three stories and it's all brick. You see the Austin Lime Company down here. Up here on uh, Hudson Street is the Italian tenement. Uh, here's the school you guys have up here on Spring Street, wood. But there's only three brick structures, even though interestingly down here on Liberty Street, if you look between what they call 204 and 205, it's a saloon and a dwelling. <coughs> Both of them are wood, but it's got a brick wall between them. Who would want to live next to a saloon? I would, I'd want a brick wall there too. So what we're talking about is just this middle section right here was part of it. And then they add the brick structure to the west and the wood structure to the right. But you see how it's yellow in the middle and then pink around the edges. So what that means is the, the, the addition to the left there is wood with a brick facade. The one to the right is brick. And you see the X's there, that means there's wood shingle roofs. And you see this, the, the solid filled in circle there on the two story wooden addition. It's uh, that, <clears throat> that means it's a composition roof. And if you look down here at the intersection, you see a 50 with a circle, that's a 50 foot cistern for water. Scott, what year is that map? Do you uh, know? This one's 19, 1924, I think. Thank you. The original one was 1904. Thank you. Here's the back, but I love this. These are, um, see those Y's there? Those and, and a lot of brick structures are structural. Some people call them brick stars. And uh, now that I point them out to you, you can't not see them. They're everywhere. Uh, these aren't particularly decorative. Of course they can be. But the next time you're watching a Seinfeld episode and they, they show that outer portion of his apartment, the, the window, you see the brick stars underneath. Now I can't unsee it. Um, there they are. What a lot of times these brick stars would run through the whole building with iron and kind of prevent it from bowing out. And of course, people collect them in England and they call them Patras plates. Um, and they were decorative. Here's another one of your brick structures. Beautiful one, two rockets, three stories. So here it is, 35 feet tall, three stories, eight and 12. So eight inches above, 12 inches, 12 inches in the first floor, this 
thickness of the structural brick and eight inches above it. I know that you guys talk in, in one of the books, it talks about the fact that if you look at the windows, there's um, uh, two, three bricks over the bottom windows and two bricks over the top. So what they are is a result of the thickness of the bricks. So uh, with a 12 inch thick brick wall would need three above the window an eight inch brick wall would only need two. And you can see it there, three bricks and then two bricks above. Another picture of it, beautiful. I like white brick. Now, I, this is, uh, I was speaking to the gentleman before it lives there. I love this, I love this, uh, this dwelling. This is, to me, uh, this represents Sparta to everybody in the community. Uh, you come down the, you come down Lower Spring right to that stop, and it's right there in front of you, and it's it's beautiful. Uh, it's a great brick structure, um, but it wasn't originally like this. So you look to the one to the right. That's it's called a Flemish bond. Let's see here. So originally, this is 1911. There's that 12 Liberty right there. 12 Liberty right there. So 12 and 12. So it's two stories. 12 inches thick on the walls. You see the X up there in the corner. That means it had a wooden, uh, a wooden roof. And there, then there are three additional wooden structures attached to it. One that has a composition roof, one that has a metal roof, and then another composition roof. I don't know, I don't know what they were. But at the time, it was just that small part to the right before they add this big section here to the right, to the, to our left. But at the time in 1911, it was wood. And then 1920, by 1924, you could see it's all bricked in. Those wooden structures are gone. <clears throat> it's all pink. And if you look in the back, you see a two-story wooden structure surrounded by pink. So that's a two-story structure uh, of wood with a with a brick facade, and also there on the left, facing the west, it looks like a bay window that was added, also in wood. It's also yellow. So they really, really go into great detail uh, talking about these structures. They're they're wonderful, uh, wonderful resources. And if you want to see bricks today, you know, actually, bricks are cool again. So you can go down to Brooklyn where they'll saw a brick in two for you and, and charge an exorbitant amount of money. And then you can go in and glue it on your wall and pretend you have a brick wall again, which you probably do anyway. <laughs> you could also go onto the Hudson Valley Brick uh, website and you can look up any of your bricks on it and find out uh, where they came from and what, what was, what's the story behind them. It's a great website, I can't recommend it enough. And that's it. Uh, anybody have any questions for me? You can go ahead and unmute yourself so that you can speak directly to Doug. We did have one question in the chat as you were going along. Uh, Bob Catanti wants to know, how did you get, how did they get the access? And he's referring to the Sanborn maps to get all that much information on private homes. I don't know. I imagine part of the deal was if you wanted fire insurance, you had to give them access. Fire was a big deal back then, and you had to be insured. Um, so I suspect if you didn't, just, if you decided not to give them access, you weren't getting fire insurance. And I have a question about access to the Sanborn maps. Where did you get to them? I got these from the Library of Congress, where you can go and they're searchable. They're searchable by um, by community. There's over twelve thousand of them. They're an incredible resource i really i really really was impressed you could really they're a deep they're a deep wormhole you can get lost in for a while there are about six sets that are that uh are on asening which are they start in the 1890s and they go up to 1924 and we love those in sparta because they show what what the changes were made when um vanderlip reconstructed the area so we yeah. have some Let's see. Any more questions? I'm getting just tons of fascinating. This was amazing. <laughs> I have a question. There you go. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, given that the Hudson River is fresh water in part of it and salt water, as we know, in part of it, did this affect the brick composition? You know something? When the brick was formed, it was all fresh. Ah. Okay. So, and not until about uh, 8,000 years ago, when the polar ice caps melt and the ocean rises, does it get become brackish? So when the, and that's a good question. Now that you say, it, I don't know if <laughs> salt water affects clay or not, but I'll okay. find out. Okay. <laughs> Scott, I had a question about uh, Crawbucky Park. Yeah. If you go hiking through uh -oh. there, and you get to the high point, there seemed to be some bricks scattered around. I wonder if that was a brickwork of any kind? No, that was put there by, they did find bricks there, part of old structures, and the park guys put that there as just a way to show you some of the old bricks they found in the area. It's pretty cool. Oh, okay. Pretty cool. Scott, what was that website again for the bricks where you could just find out where they're from if you typed in the name on the brick? It's Hudson Valley brick making or Hudson Valley bricks. It's um, you search so it. Just Google easy. it. Okay. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, you could also go to um, the Hudson Valley Brick Museum where they have them all on the wall and they got a tremendous amount of resources there as well. Did Thomas Jefferson invent the self supporting brick walls we see at Monticello? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I know he was an architect. I don't, I don't know much about Monticello. Sorry. <laughs> Margaret just posted the uh, URL for the brick collecting in Hudson Valley. Excellent. The, the website. That's in the chat. By all means, you know, Havistraw is one of those places that no one from here ever goes to because it's such a hassle to get to. It's got no major highway going to it. You can't drive over there. I mean, you, you could probably swim there faster than you could drive. But if you ever get an opportunity to go over, maybe on the ferry, you know, check out the Brick Museum, walk the shoreline there. It's really it's got a lot of history there, a lot of history. Yeah, you can Our check out the ferry, uh, Scott, uh, uh, and go over for dinner, but make sure you know when the boat leaves coming back. <laughs> we did yeah, it oh, we did it um we took the ferry over and uh we thought we'd have to get a taxi to get up the hill but the um uh the attendant on the ferry and this is a several years ago said uh he talked to somebody that he knew and the gentleman drove us up the hill and then we walked <laughs> back the yeah the ferry Kind of, kind of leads you off on the south side of town. I used yeah. to go over there all the time on my bike, and it was easy to bike right into town. But um, where, however you do it, uh, it's worth. It's a great place to paddle too. It's a great place to kayak or canoe, and uh, I, I really love it. I love it. Hey, uh, uh, one, one, one question. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I asked a question about the the uh, brick wall in Monticello. I forgot to use the word serpentine. Oh, which it, it if you if you can picture it, it goes. It's a vertical wall, and so it can't really knock knock itself over. And my, I'm clarifying only because my question was unclear without that word serpentine. I still don't know, but that means seems to make more sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Anyway, it was a very interesting talk, and I'm glad that we chimed in. Of course. Yes, and thank you very very much. You're welcome. I see that Martin has his hand raised. Martin Smolin, did you have a question? Uh, yes, sort of. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Scott for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, but I was thinking way back to Babylonia, ancient Babylonia. You mentioned the bricks there. And while you were talking, I took out my cell phone, which seems to know everything, and asked <laughs> it what the dimensions of the Babylonian bricks were. And uh, they they didn't give me all the or I couldn't see it, but uh, apparently they were twelve to fourteen inches long, which is about what you're saying the modern bricks are. I call that to your attention. It's remarkable that bricks for thousands of years have been the same. 
I think people's physical dimensions have been the same for thousands of years. And it's no, we've gotten that. taller. Hey, yeah, we've gotten we actually have the resident, a resident from One Rock Ledge with us this evening, and she notes for everybody that that they had always heard that their living room floor was made from bricks used for ballast at the Sparta shipyard. Oh. It's an interesting well, note. That was uh, the that's not uncommon, and um, the bricks used in uh, the old Dutch church supposedly also came from ballast. That was not uncommon. And Leslie oh, yeah. notes that another place to visit in Haverstraw is the Garner Arts, which is pre-Civil War textiles. Check that out when you go. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? No, that was great. It was amazing. Anybody, yeah. anybody who's new who would like to join the jug. <laughs> That's good. This was a marvelous presentation, Scott. Thank you so much. Oh, I uh, learned a lot. It was fascinating. And uh, we had 65 plus people on here. Um, <laughs> I think that's a record. And um, yay. <laughs> it, was, it was marvelous. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, thanks for doing the research. Oh, it was my, my pleasure. I can't wait to see everybody at the library. Okay. We'll be there. We'll be there. All right.